Welcome to Taikon 2013. Uh, Venkatesh Shukla, President of Thai Silicon Valley. And it's my honor and privilege to welcome you all to this 20th edition of Taikon. It's a tribute to the vision, the enduring appeal of the vision of the founders that so many people from 30 different countries are here today. And there are events like this all around the globe in different chapters. The vision, the vision has, you know, is potent and survived and has flourished. The, as a, you know, as successful as a Thai Silicon Valley has been and as prestigious it has been, the, as a new leader of, of Thai Silicon Valley, the challenge is to balance continuity with change. And change we must, because the environment in which we operate keeps changing. So there are a few changes that, uh, that we have made uh, you know, in Thai, in Silicon Valley. The most significant change has been involvement of Thai in funding entrepreneurs. This program started a few years ago called Thai Angels, and I'm, and I'm delighted that a number of different chapters of Thai have embraced that concept now. Another very significant change uh, that we are about to roll out is this a B2B incubator accelerator we are calling Thai Launchpad. We are raising $3.6 million for that from among members of Thai. And we are almost, we are almost about 80% there. It will be rolled out in two, three months. And this idea of funding, coupled with a structured, long-term engagement as a mentor, this is one of the most significant changes in Thai, in Silicon Valley. As successful as Taikon has been, uh, the recipe needed fresh ingredients. It's been around for 20 years. So the change in Taikon is that the Friday, today's session, is purely about professional growth. There are three parallel day-long conferences focused on hottest areas of innovation. And Saturday is typically what you have come to expect of Taikon. Both these days are very, very exciting. You know, as, as president of Thai Silicon Valley, I'm really blessed to have an outstanding team of 300 volunteers working on this conference for the last six months. And it's another tribute to uh, the culture and to the values of this, this organization that there are highly successful people who volunteer their time for a long, long period of, or a long stretches to bring you Taikon. So, uh, let me introduce to you uh, the two conveners of this organization, uh, Taikon, who have put this together, and they will take, uh, they'll introduce you to the rest of Taikon and introduce you to the rest of the volunteers as well. In keeping with the glorious traditions of Thai, both these gentlemen are highly successful entrepreneurs, and for the last six months, they have committed to see a bulk of their uh, bulk of their time in putting this conference together. So I'm delighted to introduce to you uh, the two conveners, Paul Singh and Sanjay Shiroli. Paul, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone? Come on, let's. You can do better. Good morning. Morning. I think people in the back just start too shy. Okay. Uh, what we're going to talk about? Uh, we felt that you know, Tycon is like any other startup. So all of you are really entrepreneurs, so you can relate to the story. 
So we're going to talk about the story of Tycon 2013 as a startup and what we really do. So like every other startup, we have a product. And what is our product? That is what you're here for. And our product is going to be, you know, the Friday sessions and the Saturday sessions, and you see the details there. About 220 speakers are going to be here for the next two days. So the amount of brain power that is there for you to really go and have a great education and learning experience. Uh, so looking forward to that. Now, Tycon will not be Tycon if we did not offer enough networking opportunities. Obviously, there is a lot of informal networking that goes on in the hallways, in the coffee shops, but we have also created many formal networking events. So you have Mentor Connect for people who want to have more or less a one-on-one -on -one coaching with a senior uh, mentor, and I'm hoping that you have registered for it because otherwise they're totally sold out. And then we have created this year a new program. If you are looking for your next co-founder, please come in uh, to the room upstairs, and there is a Founder Connect at lunchtime. And then there is the Mobile Connect. If any of you have not downloaded the app, please go to Google or Apple App Store and look for Visible and under that Tycon 2013. In addition to that, we have 50 of the hottest companies that have been selected by the Thai 50 committee, the early startups, and they're going to be presenting all day in room M1, that is Mission City Ballroom number one, and then we have 18 of the hardest startups in the three technology areas that are going to present in the lightning round right after the keynote. So please be there. You know, what can a startup do without funding? So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the funders for Tycon, basically our sponsors. I'd like to thank all the platinum sponsors, the gold sponsors, the silver sponsors, and of course, we have a whole bunch of annual sponsors who make sure that Tycon or Thai Silicon Valley can conduct an annual host of programs throughout the year. I'd also like to thank and give a shout out to all the media sponsors that we've had. Well, you won't be here if we didn't have a great marketing and sales. And to tell you some of the facts, and I know a lot of you complain about being spammed too much by us, uh, sorry, but that seems to work uh, because all of you are here. Uh, so one thing though, just as a matter of people who are in marketing, we generated over 10 million impressions in just the last three months. That is the power of marketing that has been done by an excellent team of marketing and sales. I'd like to also touch upon Expo. We've had a fantastic Expo this year, represented by about 148 different companies from 10 different countries. I would also like to point out that we have a wonderful media lounge with four mini studios in there so that we can talk to a whole bunch of speakers and other folks who are critical for Tycon to be successful. Well, like any startup, Team is what makes the difference. And you know, we have one of the best teams that has put together this, and yes, it does take a village to put Tycon together. So please give a big hand to the 300 volunteers that have been working for six months to bring this team. And finally, to come to all of you. I know some of you are wondering, where are all of those attendees? But they're coming. This is Silicon Valley Startup. We have flex times here, so don't worry, they're all coming. We set a record this year with over 3,500 attendees. So we appreciate all of you coming here and signing up for it. And just to give you an idea of the variety and the diversity of the entrepreneurs and the technologists, we have people from about 30 countries who are here. So many of you in the startup world might be thinking, so what's the difference between Tycon and any other startup? Yes, there is one difference. Our GA date is fixed. So the conference is delivered today. The first customership occurs today. And so we are here to present to you the conference. But again, you know, geeks need to have fun as well. So we've created a lot of entertainment and party time for you. 
on both days, Friday and Saturday, Friday in the Expo Hall from 6 to 8, Saturday in the Expo Hall from 6 to 8, and then again from 9 till midnight. So come and party, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. So let me uh, introduce uh, someone who has really done an amazing job to bring these excellent speakers here on the stage. Uh, and he is going to talk about the agenda for the rest of the day. So let me welcome Naveen Bisht. Good morning. Let me just wait for a second for my slides to come. All right. Good morning again. I see Miss smiling there. We're really excited to have you all here. We have created great content for you for next two days with over 220 plus speakers. And thanks to a great content team of over 75 plus expert advisors and volunteers who made it happen by working since late last year. We have a packed agenda today focused on uh, three hardest technology sectors, mobility, big data, and software-defined infrastructure. In each track, we have two keynotes from leading executives from that sector. Then we have lightning round of six hardest emerging startups. Then we have a VC panel of experts who are investing in these sectors to give you insight and trends in what they are seeing and where they are investing. The format in each track is a combination of 30-minute panels and 15-minute fireside chats. We made it so that we can get as many as experts over here and so that you can make the most out of it. Mobility is one of the fastest growing technology segments. It's revolutionizing every aspect of our lives from the way we, to, we pay to the way we play. Some of the hardest topics we'll cover in this track are Internet of Things, Enterprise Mobility, Mobile Ecosystem, and Mobile Payments. And then Big Data, another hardest technology segment. All the data created and replicated in 2013, this year, will reach around 4 billion terabytes, which is 4x increase from 2010. That means lots of more op opportunities for modeling and mining to understand customer usage patterns, insights, and business processes. Again, focus will be on all hot topics in big data. Third parallel track we have is software-defined infrastructure. Again, this has witnessed tremendous innovation with brand new ways of computing, networking, and storage. The track will focus on networking and storage, again, on SDN, <coughs> software-defined storage, and software-defined infrastructure management. So please make sure to make the most out of all these three tracks. Now, I would like to introduce Urshid Parekh, founder and CEO of Store Simple, a pioneer in cloud storage gateway company which was acquired by Microsoft last year. Urshid is going to introduce our grand keynote speaker and moderator. Urshid. Good morning, everyone. Uh, while it may be hard to kind of for an entrepreneur to build a company, it's even harder for somebody to actually take a mega, mega company, a company with 100,000 people, and actually get it uh, focused on uh, benefiting from market transitions. Uh, at Microsoft, Satya Nadella is called upon to do just that. He did that for Microsoft by building out the Microsoft Dynamics CRM and ERP business. Uh, he did the same for Microsoft Online Services by uh, actually making Bing what you see as it is today, and he's doing the same for the cloud. Um, so for Satya, his team at Microsoft is delivering Cloud OS. Uh, which is Microsoft's uh, next generation enterprise platform for cloud computing. 
Satya is the president of Microsoft's cloud server and tools division. It is a $19 billion division and, uh, and uh, has flagship products like Windows Server, SQL Server, Windows Azure. Now joining him up uh, for this uh, keynote uh, uh, chat is going to be Naveen Chadha. Naveen is the managing director of the Mayfield Fund. Um, Naveen is also an accomplished entrepreneur. His first company, V Extreme, was acquired by Microsoft and it actually became uh, Windows Media Technologies. He founded a company called IBM Broadcasting then went public and then decided that uh, he was gonna go become a VC. Uh, as a VC, he's been uh, a regular uh, on the Forbes Midas list, has had uh, 12 IPOs, 12 acquisitions, and so without further delay, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Naveen and Satya to Tycon. Good morning, everyone. Satya, thanks a lot for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I Thank know you. Like, you guys get to do a lot of this stuff, and we really appreciate you taking the time. So as Urshit mentioned, you're responsible for heading server tools and the cloud services division at Microsoft, which does over 19 billion in revenues, which is much more than many of the public companies do in Silicon Valley and in the world. So what's your overall strategy for server, cloud, and tools, and how are you doing in each segment? Sure. First of all, thanks uh, so much, Naveen, uh, for the invitation. It's a real privilege to be here amongst uh, all these entrepreneurs. Um, you know, if you look at it fundamentally, if you're in the infrastructure business, in fact, our history, the way we got to the success that we've gotten to was not by actually thinking of infrastructure independent of our apps. Uh, to some degree, we keep it simple. In other words, we build infrastructure to support our own first-party applications. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we did this the last time around. It's not as if we build Windows Server. We build Windows Server to support our own Exchange, SQL, Link, SharePoint. And now going forward for us, the thing that's really driving what we do on our infrastructure with Windows Azure in particular, or even our server infrastructure, is things like Skype are driving it, Bing is driving it, Xbox Live, uh, and so they were an Office 365. So the variety of diverse first party workloads built for web scale, internet scale, uh, is what's causing us to reinvent every layer of our infrastructure. So when it comes to the core resource management, uh, of storage, network, and compute, we have to think about data center and multiple data center scale. Uh, when it comes to the data, we want to build uh, the data platform to be able to do applied machine learning at the scale of Bain, uh, which means uh, you'd need to have a variety of different storage systems and processing systems. Uh, then the application platform, everyone is building applications, including our own applications, which are mobile first in many cases, uh, with cloud computing on the back end. So you have to invent a new app model. Uh, for that. And lastly, you've got to make all of these applications reachable to all of the variety of devices that both consumers and business users use. So that's at the core of what we call the cloud OS, so reinventing of the infrastructure in support of the modern needs of our own applications, which turns out is what everyone else needs, and that's how we productize as part of Windows Azure. Got it. So you mentioned like a few terms, and those are some of the themes of Tycon this year. So with consumerization of IT and an era of mobile first, where do you see the opportunities and your offerings with respect to software-defined data centers? Yeah, so when it comes to software-defined data center, that's where I think if you sort of go back to a core operating system, it does two things. It does resource management, and then it exposes an application platform so that the application developers have to, not to deal with the resources at the lowest level. So to me, what we are doing in terms of building this new management software to manage resources of compute storage network at the data center and multi-data center scale is our definition of software-defined data center. Um, and so that's very much core to what we embody inside of Azure. And of course, as an application developer, you don't see any of mm -hmm. that. But if you want to stand up your own cloud, it turns out Azure runs on Windows Server. Uh, because at the end of the day, people ask me, how did your hypervisor get so much better <coughs> suddenly? Uh, the only trick there was you run it at scale yourself, and suddenly things get much better. Uh, so this notion of eating your own dog food actually matters a lot. And so therefore, that's what we did. And so uh, we now have perhaps one of the unique uh, positions of not only running an at-scale cloud distributed service, 
but also making the same infrastructure available for anyone else. Uh, because our vision of distributed computing is not that one North American company is going to capture the world's compute storage network in their own data centers. That's too limited a view. Uh, there are too much of geo, you know, ge the geography is so diverse, the regulatory environment is so diverse that you need to be able to you know, provide that. The second trend you talked about is also a very big change in how IT uh, provisions a lot of this infrastructure, which is the consumerization. And I think the thing that everyone now get, comes to expect as a user mm -hmm. is that I bring in my dis device to work, and I want all my data and all my applications. Uh, but then, at the same time, the company needs to sign uh, to make sure things are compliant. Uh, and so that's where we really are trying to get that balance, which is how do you still have the ability to secure access to your information and applications? while allowing every device to participate in the enterprise. Got it. So you do see an open world where you don't think it's just going to be one provider, whether it's on-prem or whether it's a public cloud provider. So one of the things we're going to talk later at the conference is all this stuff that's going on in public clouds, private clouds, hybrid clouds. How do you see these worlds interoperating? Because it seems for a customer, they should have no lock-in. They should be able to go to AWS, they should be able to go to Azure, whether the on-prem stuff is on VMware or Microsoft. So how do you envision the world? Like, where is it going to be in the next five to seven years? Right, I mean, I think the two things that I absolutely hold as truisms is you approach the enterprise business, as well as uh, the evolution of this technology. One is things will remain distributed. Um, I think that any notion of just complete central control, there are more efficient ways. It's not as if people have to deploy servers under their desk. Uh, which sometimes can become very, very inefficient. Uh, but you do definitely uh, have to ha account for distribution because otherwise no amount of centralization uh, will work for the, uh, the diversity of needs. Now, to complement that though, uh, we do need uh, to be able to have consistency. Uh, you, of course you want, and then the other thing about the enterprise customer is they're not going to be homogenous. They're always going to have uh, a lot of heterogeneous systems. So you have to support that reality in any solution you come up with. So that's why we took the position that we absolutely want to run as a first party, an at scale public cloud. But we also want to make that same infrastructure available. So there's no lock-in from that perspective. There's no such notion as you write an application for Windows Azure and you can't check out. You can check out any time. Uh, you can go to you know, deploy it in a service provider. You can deploy it in uh, your own data center. And that, I think, is core to our hybrid uh, notion. But it, then you still have to solve, though, for some consistency. Because just because you say, hey, I can distribute everything, you can explode the cost if you don't really have virtualization that's consistent, identity management that is consistent, app models that are consistent, management fabric so that I can actually have one service model uh, and give me visibility even in a single application that's probably split between public and private. Uh, and so that requires investment. Uh, and I think over time there will be even standardization. But I would say uh, that's a place where, again, we are very, very uniquely focused on is how do we make sure that even Windows Azure and Windows Server have that consistency with depending on where it's deployed. Got it. And I think to envision a lot of this stuff coming together, there's a lot of problems that need to get solved. And we have a room filled with entrepreneurs and executives. So where do you see opportunities over the next three to five years? Microsoft clearly is a platform company. Where do you, and it has built a great ecosystem over the years of ISVs. So where do you see opportunities for like startups to go add value on top of the stuff which is happening? Because that's very relevant to this conversation and also to this conference. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, I mean, it's an, it, it, you and I have talked about this in the past as well, which is, it's probably one of the most exciting times uh, in enterprise infrastructure. You know, I, you know, you've always seen a couple of trends that have been hot, but this is one of the first times I believe that there are four or five of these trends that are all hot at the same time. Um, and so you have two trillion dollars of IT spend up for grabs. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to sort of talk to my own team about is, in spite of our success, which has been great, but it's still, uh, we're a low share player. Our 19 billion dollars of that two trillion is not much. Uh, so the real opportunity is to be able to go after that displacement and value creation uh, at a variety of layers. Everything from, you can be in the software-defined data centers, you can be in uh, application uh, platforms. 
But when I, I mean, one of the things, in fact, one of the companies uh, the, you know, that uh, you funded and Urshid started, which we recently acquired, uh, is a great opportunity which really disrupts the storage business in a pretty fundamental way. Um, and uh, their idea of cloud tiering storage to drive down cost and increase reliability was a pretty smart way for them to come up with. Uh, and that's obviously uh, something that I think we see in many, many other areas, like even networking. But if I had to sort of think about what 10 years from now, if we're sitting down here and sort of trying to characterize ex post, what was this generation or this era all about? Uh, that's an interesting question. My own feeling is, of course, infrastructure will change and there will be a significant amount of opportunity. Uh, but I think it'll be probably the data and more in particular, people who have been able to do the most innovative work to convert data into insights and action. Uh, because if you think about our uh, previous generation, it was all about automation and communication. So business process automation and communication drove productivity uh, in a pretty significant way in the economy. And the next drive of IT-driven productivity gain uh, is probably going to be information, uh, but not just information uh, at sort of that is accessible, but information that's being used to really drive insights and action. Got it. And what is the best way for startups and entrepreneurs to approach Microsoft, especially around this cloud OS vision? Because there's a lot of problems that need solving. Yeah. And Store Simple is a good example. You guys had the BizSpark program. So how do we, as a community, get you guys access to some of these opportunities for, um, for our entrepreneurs to have a constant dialogue with Microsoft in these areas? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say this is a, a very uh, important priority for me personally even to, one, engage with the community, especially in the Silicon Valley, um, and to get a lot more entrepreneurs interested in working with us. Uh, we have some very broad programs like BizSpark, which have been around for a while. We're making the offers in BizSpark uh, very compelling and relevant uh, for what you want to do today. So, for example, there's a lot of Azure credits, so you can come in, use BizSpark, uh, and get started with a lot of uh, Azure credits built uh, we also have um, accelerators in a couple of different cities. We even allow entrepreneurs to sit with us um, and we give them uh, co-location spaces. Uh, we also, in some cases, are also doing some venture investing. Bing Fund is probably one of the things that we just started in a very small way to get more innovation going. Uh, so we have some of those programs, and I would say BizSpark is at the tip of the spear. There's a guy called Rahul Sood, who was an entrepreneur who sold a company to HP. Now he runs the startup programs uh, for Microsoft, and he's well aware of this community and uh, what it's uh, very capable of. So I think that is where I would point people to. But the store simple example, just to sort of illustrate that, one of the things that I think we have a pretty unique opportunity for the entrepreneurs in the room is means to get to customers. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you're an entrepreneur more than anything else, uh, you know, technology and technology platforms mean a lot and that's helpful, but it access to customers. And one of the unique opportunities we have through a variety of traditional channel mechanisms and now online stores, uh, you have the capability of reaching, especially if you're focused on the enterprise customers, from what I understand, that's one of the major themes of this conference. Uh, we have some pretty unique access, and Store Simple was an example of that. I think uh, before I got to know Store Simple, uh, Store Simple already had lots of customers selling jointly with Azure. Uh, they were able to work with our field team, our channel partners, and really drive a lot of business success. Uh, so I think that that engagement, even at a field level, uh, in fact, works very well, and I would encourage uh, partners to. Uh, look at that and engage, and I'm also very directly involved in a lot of this, and I'd be interested in any feedback as well. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> a big, big area where startups would love to partner, and we had great success with Store Simple, and you see that stuff being offered to the right partners, both with Microsoft Direct Field Sales and also with the channel, because Microsoft has massive distribution. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, just recently I was just looking at the, the reseller channel for Windows Server. It's one of the most vibrant channels still for us in, in terms of the just sheer number and volume. Uh, and yes, we want to activate Office 365, which is another online business of ours that's doing very, very well. Um, and that is completely channel activated. And there are many people who are doing implementations uh, and reseller partners. 
Uh, so our goal is to take what is our cloud offering through our channel. That also means some things like Windows Azure Store, uh, which is targeting more IT buyer and developer buyers, uh, would also be accessible to our channel partners through the Azure program. So I think there are a variety of different opportunities. We're in the early days of even uh, figuring out how all the economics work here and the systems work here. Uh, but we are very, very committed to being a channel-led company in anything we do. Got it. And one of the words you just mentioned is developers, right? We see them becoming very important, right? Like, in, especially in this era of like user experience, design first. So where do you see the opportunities for both Microsoft? It has like a great developer community. People are thinking about mobile experiences. They're thinking about cloud-connected devices. Where do you see that world going? We talked about the data center, the cloud. What about the developer? Yeah, you know, one of the, the things that um, is also changing significantly in the way people go about building products is the role of the developer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you should take, if you take a game developer, um, now one of the fascinating things is um, they obviously are interested in the physics engine and they're building the physics engine or using, reusing a physics engine and making sure that the game itself is fantastic. But they're also deeply involved uh, in how to make sure that the game shows up appropriately in all of the various store app stores. Uh, how do they collect data back? Uh, in fact, Halo 4 uh, is so interactive in the form of its learning from data. Uh, every day they're changing their modes and maps and detecting fraud and what have you. And all that's happening on Azure. Uh, but the developer is much more of this real-time, you know, a cycle where they're managing this continuous improvement. Uh, so where does development end and where does things like marketing and uh, learning from usage uh, begin? Uh, that's blurring. So I think that workflow of what a developer does needs to be you know, supported with a complete new tool chain. Uh, and so this is, people talk about it as DevOps or Dev uh, without Ops, and those life cycles are real. Uh, so we are taking everything that we have done with uh, Visual Studio as well as our online services uh, that support Visual Studio from source control, build, uh, analytics, uh, and making sure that we are current in terms of these new workflows. Got it. <clears throat> I think this conference, as you know, is not only about like what's happening in the business community startups, but we have some great content around personal development tomorrow. And one of the things is, among the Indian communities, right, like you're one of the people who has gotten to the top and is running a $19 billion division. Many few people of Indian origin today are at that level. We're doing well with startups. Basically, we create companies, but $19 billion is big. It's really, really big. So we'd love to shift gears and talk about a little bit about your story from Hyderabad to University of Wisconsin, then Sun then University of Chicago for your MBA, which I think like you were doing like flying between yeah. Edmund, I remember when we worked together. Uh, so 20 years at Microsoft, right? Like what are the key lessons? Did you have mentors? Because it's a great ride, right? On what has happened. So any take for our yeah, I mean, audience? It's first thing I would say is um, at least the way I like to sort of motivate myself in the way I'm wired is I want to learn more from folks in this room versus sort of you know, talk about anything that I can sort of uh, give as advice because I think once you stop learning, you stop doing um, anything useful. So therefore that I think if more than anything else uh, is perhaps what shaped even my own uh, experiences. Uh, but there are a couple of, um, you know, lots of mentors along the way, but quite frankly, when I look back, uh, even just the first job I had at Microsoft and the first boss I had at Microsoft had a lot to do with a couple of different things that I picked up and that have, you know, more and more I think about it. Uh, were re, you know, reinforcing. Uh, the first thing was you've got to work hard um, and there's no substitute and I think people in this room uh, are definitely get that and do that. Um, the second thing that I also think that I uh, really got pretty early on was uh, life as well as your careers and everything else are short-term inefficient, long-term efficient. Um, so I remember going to my first boss and sort of complaining to him about uh, my first review and uh, he looks at me and says, hey look, you know, he gives me this aphorism of you know, the life is not always efficient, but it, in the end it is efficient. 
Um, and so with some amount of patience and a lot of persistence, um, you can really uh, get to where you want to get to. Uh, but the other thing that I think if I had to sort of really look at what shaped um, my own attitude to work and life uh, has been is you got to, at the end of the day, in a large company, in a small company, get things done. And you're never going to get things done by just being uh, an, a person who does their own best work. You've got to get the best out of the people. Um, that means you've, one, got to learn from every place, uh, but you also have to motivate. And that, you know, you have to have a very, very deep sense of empathy, uh, which I think in the long run trumps, uh, to be controversial, even IQ. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, uh, that combination is what you've got to get right, uh, either a large company, a small company, whatever, life or at home, uh, or you know, I work at or at home. And so that's sort of the things that at least I've learned along the way, some successfully, some still learning. Got it. And I think all of us struggle. One of the words you mentioned is like family and home. I think most of us suffer from this work-life balance. So have you improved over the years? Like what are some of the tips? like people need to keep in mind. I think all of us struggle. Yeah, I mean, uh, just the other day I was listening to uh, Michael Christensen, who has got a great book, uh, which is, I think it's something along how do you measure your life, uh, where he has this fantastic framework, uh, which up is applied to innovation at work. Uh, but he sort of basically says you've got to have balance. Um, because one of the things that we all get caught up is in this trap, uh, perhaps, of immediate satisfaction uh, at work that you can derive. Right? Rising, you know, raising a child is a long-term bet, because on a daily basis, your child is not going to say what a great dad you are. Uh, but in the long run, it'll catch up with you if you're not nice to them uh, or they're not nice to you either. Uh, but when it comes to uh, work, you can say, well, the next promotion or the next IPO or the next investment, uh, yeah. and you can get caught up on it. Um, and I wouldn't claim that any of us, or at least I've cracked the balance there, but if anything, for me, for example, I know for sure uh, when I'm all said and done, uh, we have two special needs kids uh, that we raise, uh, so for us, a lot of our life is defined by that. Uh, it gives me a perspective for sure on what it means to be a dad of children who need help. Uh, and that to me, since that happened pretty early on for my wife and me when we were young, uh, that has shaped a lot of our attitude, I think. Uh, the way I look at it and how I get up in the morning each day to get to work uh, and uh, knowing uh, fully well that when it's all said and done, perhaps what is most important to me is did I do the thing right for my children? Uh, that shapes a lot of my attitude, even at work. Got it. Now, that's very, very interesting. So, <clears throat> you've worked at Microsoft for 20 years, right? Like, they must have done something right. And how have you seen Microsoft change over the years, right? Like, we got the opportunity to work together in the late 90s, but I don't have perspective, right? Like, over the last 12 years, especially. So, is it different, like, you guys are changing the way things are done? Or, like, what's your view? Or, like, if you reflect back? Yeah, if you... It, this high-tech business is just a fascinating business because by definition, uh, it's not built for longevity, right? I mean, if you look at it, um, it's all about being able to reinvent yourself every second, every day. Uh, if not, uh, you're going to die. Um, and so if you look at our, whatever, 30 plus years of history, uh, to be at the center of it, and the attitude that I think comes from Bill and Steve is uh, we would rather die than be irrelevant. Uh, mm -hmm. That has been something that uh, has always uh, caused us to say, hey, look, we sometimes create trends, we can fall behind on trends, but if you are at any given point in time not working on what's most relevant, uh, and stick sticking with it, um, you know, you are going to be relevant in the long run. Uh, and so I think that's what's happened. Even my own 20 plus years in the company, we've got, you know, lots of things that have come and gone uh, where there was not a day at Microsoft. I remember thinking that, wow, we've got it made. I mean, most people think that, oh, wow, the early 90s were great. And quite believe me, early 90s were as competitive as uh, the 2013 was, and nothing was guaranteed. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, you've got to come at it with that you know, attitude of both confidence and the humility uh, that you are not on the top of the hill. Because the day you get any one of those things wrong, if you don't have the confidence that you can actually go you know, conquer the hill, or you think uh, that you don't have the humility to recognize your true position, either one of those things can really uh, be an issue. 
So it seems like humility, it's a marathon, not a sprint, persistent, those are some of the values you've seen in paranoia, right? Like essentially, you need to earn the right to live another day. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. So what's your view of Microsoft's image in Silicon Valley compared to like Google, Apple, some of the other companies here? You know, we uh, have had, I think, uh, different eras of our own, um, uh, or at least how people have viewed us uh, over the years. Uh, I think that at this point, uh, the company uh, is, what it's striving to do is to build itself as a great place for people who are innovating in Silicon Valley. First of all, we have a very huge operation uh, in Silicon Valley, so we definitely want to be uh, one of the companies that's built here and uh, does great work here. Uh, we want to definitely be a source of uh, you know, market opportunity for a lot of entrepreneurs here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a place where, given some of the traditional business model uh, and go-to-market structures we've had, uh, I think we stand a very, very good chance to be perhaps a much bigger and better partner uh, for a lot of companies that are getting started now, uh, or on the cloud, or on mobile, or on data, and what have you. Uh, and so that's at least what we would strive to do. Uh, our reputation at the end of the day will be uh, really made up of two things. One is our market success. Uh, and our success, uh, especially in the enterprise market, is you know, unquestionable in the sense that we still have significant momentum mm -hmm. um, in the traditional enterprise and we have growing momentum in the cloud. Uh, and that combined with, I think, creating a platform and an opportunity for entrepreneurs is what I think will define our reputation. Got it, got it. No, that's very helpful. So one of the things, like sometimes, right, like image between entrepreneurs is created by how are companies giving them their tech platform, you talked about it, how are they helping them with distribution, which is big. Everybody talks about it, but who really gets your distribution? And we have first-hand experience with Microsoft, like helping companies on the go-to-market strategy here. Uh, we talked about investments a little bit, but at the end, entrepreneurs do care about acquisitions too. And Store Simple is a good example. And I know, like, you can't make forward looking statements, so I won't go there because I know the answer will be like, no comments. Uh, what do you look for in entrepreneurs or in companies, right? Because at the end, you're making a bet on people. So, what are you looking for? Even, I think if you look at even uh, some of the senior leaders and the company today, um, as well as in many, many parts of the company, uh, a lot of people came out of uh, different uh, acquisitions. Uh, in fact, a guy that you and I worked with who leads our mobile uh, business today, Terry Myerson, came through a Microsoft acquisition. Uh, so I would say, first of all, I think people who are entrepreneurs, by definition, are risk takers, uh, people who uh, are innovators, and so that's the kind of talent uh, with the given the keys can do fantastic things. We recognize that and you see it even in amongst the people uh, at the company. And so more than anything else, uh, I think we want to have that entrepreneurial spirit continuously renewed in the company and the best way to do that is to be take you know you know uh, take the acquisitions you do uh, and make the people who run those companies pretty successful in the uh, in the larger context of Microsoft and we've done a lot I mean in over the last even year I mean between Skype and Yammer and Store Simple uh, we've had a broad set of folks who've come in and are having significant impact uh, Yammer being one of the latest examples of a hyper growth uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, acquisition for us so it seems like there's a lot of progress on that end too. So coming back to more right on the personal management and leadership style, it seems from what we are hearing from people inside and outside, the pace of innovation within this $19 billion division has picked up a lot. There's a lot of openness to partnering with companies, investments, acquisitions. Any advice to our entrepreneurs on what does it take to lead such a big team? How many people are in your team? Quite a few, quite a few. We don't break down, but let's say tens of thousands. Yeah, ten thousand or so people. But you know, at the end of the day, it's this coming together of, I'd say, the concept, uh, you know, capability and culture that really defines what an organization does. And with success, you really have had these three things in lockstep. Uh, and now the issue with tech is things change. The concept becomes less relevant. Capability needs to be renewed, 
uh, culture which gets optimized for one capability will need to be renewed. So the question really is when the technology shifts, uh, how do you at the right time take all these three things in lockstep and move them? Uh, and that is both uh, the most interesting part of my job as well as the challenge. Uh, but I would say that's the place where the company, I mean, the, we've got the ability to go question ourselves on these three fronts at a constant basis. Uh, and I wouldn't claim that any one of these things is a solved problem, uh, but we definitely are at it. And you know, some of the work that we've done, especially in Office 365, Xbox Live, and Azure, are testament to what's possible uh, there's not that many companies with the kind of success we've had in the past uh, that also are doing some cutting edge relevant things uh, in this area. And that I think is perhaps one of the unique attributes of what we've done. So I'm being told we're just running out of time. One last thing, any parting advice to our audience? I think the, the only thing that I would say is do what you do best, which is be bold, be innovative, be risk takers. Um, and I think uh, that the, in this particular moment, it's real, I mean, in, in the Silicon Valley, everybody talks about it being a constant renaissance, but I think at this point, with the number of trends at play, the amount of opportunity and value creation uh, there is, uh, this is a great time to be an entrepreneur, and it's a great time for us as companies that can enable entrepreneurs to reach their goals, uh, and so I'd say be bold. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for Thank taking you. the time. Thank you so much. A pleasure hosting you.